I would like today to bring us finally towards the linear elasticity theory. We look again at this triangle from a uh, nice book. What we see here are uh, plenty of different states, plenty of different uh, phenomena described and our focus in this lecture should be on connection between the mechanical stress and the strain describing the deformation. From previous lectures, we know that both of these are described by second rank tensors and therefore the phenomenon that connects them, elasticity, is a fourth rank tensor. So we will be dealing with quantity, which in the tensorial for, uh, format has four indices. I would like you uh, to once again remind that the equation that we see in uh, on the right hand side here effectively contains two sums, sums over repeating indices, namely over the index L and K. Both of these would be running from one to three or X, Y, and Z, as long as we are in three dimensional space. <clears throat> this form is called a Hooke's law. And I'm pretty sure that all of you have heard about Hooke's law before. Um, let me note here that in the name of this law is also E, it's not a Captain Hooke, but it's uh, Hooke's law with E at the end. Um, we are relating in principle nine components of the strain tensor to the nine components of the stress tensor. And as such, the fourth rank tensor, which connects these two second rank tensor quantities, uh, contains in its most general form, 81 or nine times nine independent components. However, what we know is that the forms of stress and strain tensor are not completely three. Namely, the stress tensor and the strain tensor are both symmetrical with respect to the axis, uh, which means that there are only six independent stress and strain components. Taking this into account, that effectively the Hooke's linear relationship leads to the dependence of six stress constants on six strain constants. And therefore, the number of independent components of the CIJKL tensor reduces to only 36 components, independent components. This is achieved by requesting such identities. In the first one, we say that this fourth rank tensor is symmetrical with respect to the exchange of the first two indices. So CIJKL is the same thing as CJIKL. This comes from the symmetry of the stress tensor. In the second identity, we say that the fourth rank tensor is also symmetrical with respect to the exchange of the second pair of the indices. CIJKL is the same thing as CIJ. LK, and this is done, or this is related to the symmetry of the strain tensor. In addition, there is also a pair exchange symmetry. It means we can exchange the first and the second pair of the indices with respect to each other. This is a little bit more difficult to prove. Where does this come from? But if you take into account that later on, we will define a strain and energy, W, uh, which relates 
now the stress and strain also by this, this derivative. So the stress as a force is the derivative of the strain energy with respect to the applied strain, or in other words, it's the uh, derivative of the energy with respect to the formation. We can also from this definition obtain the fourth uh, rank tensor component CIJKL as a second derivative of the strain energy, some energy potential with respect to the two components of the strain tensor. Right? So this is nothing else than uh, the Hooke's law that we have used in uh, conjunction with the definition of how stress and the strain energy are related. <clears throat> uh, from calculus, we know that the order of derivatives is commutative. So we can exchange the order or with respect to which we calculate the derivative of the strain energy. We can calculate the derivative with respect to epsilon KL and then with, uh, with respect to epsilon IJ or we calculate it with respect to epsilon ij and then with respect to uh, epsilon al. In both cases, we obtain the same value, but from the definition, the second part is c k l i j. And from this fact that these two parts are identical, that the partial derivative is a commutative operation, we obtain this relationship that the fourth rank tensor that appears in the Hooke's law in the linear relationship between stress and strain is symmetrical also with respect to the exchange of the uh, pair of the indices. This leads to the further reduction of the independent components from 36 to the final number of 21 independent elastic constants or independent components of the fourth rank uh, tensor of elastic constant CIJKL, right? So in the most general form, in the most general uh, non-symmetrical material, the number of independent elastic constants is 21. We see a huge reduction by almost a factor of four from the general form of the fourth rank tensor, all based on the symmetries required by our definitions of stress and strain and by this mathematical identity. We will be conveniently using the folks notation that we have introduced very briefly last week already. So what we do here is that we assign to pairs of indices a number. It is all based on the fact that if you have a three by three matrix with components XX, XY, XZ, YY, YZ, and ZZ of any tensor, and we say this tensor is symmetrical, that means the component that should be down here, yx, is actually the same thing as xy. And down here, we would have zx, which is the same thing as xz. And here we should have zy, which is identical to yz. Then in order to fully define this matrix, symmetrical matrix, symmetrical tensor, we do not need to provide nine numbers, but only six numbers. And those numbers are here. The way how we number them is that we put one, two, three, four, five, six. This is how we label the components. It is nothing else than a convention, a very important convention to remember how you label these components here uh, in order to be able to reconstruct from the Folks notation from the six index notation to be able to reconstruct the tensorial notation with two indices. <clears throat> 
So knowing this, what we do for the fourth rank tensor of elastic constants, or the fourth rank tensor in Hooke's law, we actually do this pairwise. So for each pair of indices, for the first pair and the second pair, we uh, use the Foltz notation. And here we get that this is C11, right? Um, or if we have something like this, C1233, uh, then again for the first pair, C12, we see that this is the index six. For C33, we see that's index uh, three. So we get that this is labeled in two index notation in the Foix notation as C63. And from the symmetry that we have introduced on the previous slide, that the uh, pairs of indices can be exchanged, we know that this is also uh, rel uh, identical with the component C36. Where is the gain for using this uh, Foix notation? The big gain is that now this four index tensor, which is hard to right on a piece of paper can be now simply written as a six by six matrix. Before we come there, let us think about how we can write actually this four index tensor on a piece of paper, how we can provide such values. Well, if you think about the first index, the first pair of indices C11, what we are left with are two indices, both of them running from one to three. So eventually they do represent a matrix, three by three matrix. But then for another pair of the first two indices, again, we get a matrix. And so overall, we get actually a three by three matrix of three by three matrices. Each of those would be running, if we have C, I, J, K, L, then, here we have the indices KL running, and here we have the indices um, IJ, IJ for each of those. This leads us to the uh, 81 numbers that would need to be written. And of course, such representation is possible, but it's fairly confusing especially if you want to see in here all the symmetries, if you come to the fact that in the most general case, out of all of these 81 numbers, only 21 would be different, would be independent. It's hard to see from here. What happens with the folk notation? Instead of this double matrix notation, we will actually end up with a simple matrix, the way that we know it as a two-dimensional object, uh, but the price we have to pay is that now the indices do not run from one to three, but run from one to six. So this is the index I and J. And here we have C11, C12, C22, C13, C23, C33, and so on. Right. It also becomes now obvious the number of 21 independent elastic constants. Why? because it is six plus five plus four plus three plus two plus one sums to 21. Why did we exclude those? Because we have the symmetry of the matrix of elastic constants. We know that C21 is equal to C12. So here we have C12 again, right? So in this notation, the elastic constants become represented by a six by six matrix on top of that by symmetrical matrix, symmetrical with respect to the main diagram. What does change to the Hooke's law? Well, we now do have a relationship between a stress represented by a vector six by one, and strain, again, represented by a six by one vector, so six component vector, where we know that the first component, sigma one, one is sigma x, x, this is sigma y, y, and so on. Up to here, we have sigma x, y, right? So this is using the Foix notation, all right? But 
it doesn't come completely for free. When we now use this definition, we have to pay attention to a special factors that appear for the strain tensor. So, thing to remember, very critical for any usage of this uh, linear elasticity for you for the future. Foix notation is used in a straightforward manner for stress tensor. It is used for exactly this absolutely straightforward manner for the elastic constants. How we go from the fourth rank tensor to the six, uh, six by six matrix of elastic constants. However, for the strain, we need to include factor of two for the shear components. If you want to see where does this come from, just write down the whole uh, Hooke's law in the tensorial form. What you would find out is that sigma xx equals c1, so xxxx X, 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 epsilon xx X plus sigma xx X, zz epsilon zz so far so good plus cx x x y cx y plus cx x y x epsilon so that should be epsilon uh, y x plus and so on now these guys are the same those guys are the same so if I now want, and this, this represents actually the six, one, one, six component, so this one. So I get here that sigma one equals C one, one, epsilon one plus, plus C one, three, epsilon three plus C one, six, one, two times. And now we want to have epsilon six, but the epsilon six, if we want to have it really in this notation, we now have to write that this equals to two times epsilon x y, right from here. So this is where the factor two comes from. It comes from the symmetry relations again. Please do not forget about it. In fact, you remember maybe something about the engineering shear strains I was mentioning here during the lecture on elastic strain. And there we have mentioned that the engineering shear components also contain this factor of two. And therefore, in fact, this Volk's vector of strains that we have here are the components of the matrix that contains the engineering shear strains. Right? So we can say that these guys are identical with the engineering strains uh, Y, Z. And here we have the uh, gamma X, Z. And for six, six is gamma X, Y. Good. Uh, there should be an example here. But I would leave this again for you. There's uh, not a proper forum here to, to do some calculations. Um, in here, we now wanted to show how do the elastic constants, how are they transformed? Suppose that you are in, uh, you are faced with a problem that you need to rotate your coordinate system. An example of that might be that you are dealing with material, which uh, is composed of two different components. Here is an example of aluminum nitride and titanium nitride. Both of them have the same crystal structure, cubic crystal structure, sodium chloride crystal structure. Uh, but aluminum nitride is only metastable in the sodium chloride structure. When it is stable, it crystallizes in hexagonal wurzite structure. Still, there is a clear crystallographic relationship between the hexagonal and the cubic structure. And the relationship is expressed by the relation here. 
where we say that the cubic body diagonal, one, one, one direction is parallel to the hexagonal axis, triple O one axis. And one of the side diagonals of the hexagonal system, uh, sorry, of the cubic system would be along the uh, side of one of those hexagons. So um, hopefully you are familiar with the hexagonal four index Miller indices. In fact, if we have A1 here, A2 here, the C axis is perpendicular to this, uh, to this drawing. And then we have the dummy axis A3 here. The uh, 2110, uh, two bar one, bar one zero uh, direction is actually the direction which goes in A1, A1, minus A2, minus A3. So it is this direction, right? So why do we not represent this directly by one zero 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 direction? Well, the reason for that is that with these three indices, we can clearly identify symmetry equivalent directions. And we want to say that we have this direction, different color, this direction, uh, symmetry equivalent with this one, with this one, this one, this one, this one. If you are using only two indices, A1 and A2, then this would be a direction 100. This is a direction 010. And this is a direction 110. From cubic systems, when you see something like that, you obviously know that this guy and this guy are symmetry equivalent whereas this one is a different direction. If you use this three index notation for hexagonal systems, you might be confused. You do not see that, unless you are very much familiar with that, you do not see that a priori, that all those three directions are symmetry equivalent. What happens if you start using the four index notation is that this uh, first one, I'll try to use a different one, will become two bar one bar one zero direction this one will become one, one bar two direction. This one will be bar one, two bar one, zero direction. This would be bar two, one, one, zero direction. This would be uh, bar one, bar one, two, zero direction. And finally, this one is one bar two, one, zero direction. If you now look at this, the yellow expressions, all of them contain two and two ones. So you see that all what we are doing is that we are changing the signs and we permute the orders of these three numbers. The same way as you would see, say for, uh, hexa for, for cubic systems, 100 and 010 and 001 directions are equivalent with minus one zero zero and zero bar zero and so on right the last one zero so in the same sense as those are equivalent you can say those are equivalent as well what has to be fulfilled is that the sum of these three indices is always equal to zero so this is the rule for the three for the four index notation right so you have the extra index that is in fact unnecessary because you can calculate it already from knowing the first two indices um, simply by knowing that the sum of the first three indices is always equal to zero but it provides you with the possibility to immediately spot the symmetry equivalent directions and planes in hexagonal systems all right so we now know how the cube is oriented on the hexagonal system. Now suppose that your system is oriented in such a way that this is the hexagonal triple O one axis. And now we have here the cubes sitting on the surface, cubes of titanium nitride. However, for titanium nitride, this direction is not going to be the O one direction, 
know based on this crystal symmetry, uh, this crystallographic relationship, we know that this direction is going to be one, one, one direction. And your final task now is to calculate what is actually the uh, elastic constant in this direction. Whereas here you know it directly, this is going to be the C33. Now we don't know it because what we can find in the literature, C11, C12, and C44 values, they are the values where this is along the uh, cubic x-axis. So this is along the crystallographic 100 and 100 direction. All right. Uh, so C11, uh, the, that would correspond to having the cubic system oriented this way. This is the 100 direction. This is the 010 direction and so on. And uh, in this coordinate system, now C11 equals to C x x x x, which is C100, 100, and two times more 100. Right, but we are now interested in the elastic constant in a different direction in this one. Okay, so we need to rotate it. And to do that, the solution, I think it's on the next slide, right? To, to do that, you need now to rotate the coordinate system in such a way that you turn this crystallographic 111 direction into the 001 direction of your laboratory system, by which you can then, from this rotated tensor of elastic constants, you Professor, Professor, you unmute yourself. Professor, you, you mute yourself. Oh, sorry. Thank you. You scared me, but thank you very much for the comment. Okay, so um, I don't know where, uh, up to which point did you hear me, but all what you need to do is that you turn this 001 direction, uh, sorry, the 111 direction of the crystallographic system into the laboratory 001 direction. You do that by the transformation of the coordinates. So you go from the crystallographic coordinate system that you know, and you know the elastic constant in this crystallographic coordinate system, you go into the system in which you want to measure the elastic response of your system. And we will end up with such an equation that the uh, elastic constant along this, let's say, Z axis of our laboratory system is a certain combination of the components C11, C12, and C44, whatever they mean at this point, right? Since there is a linear relationship between uh, stress and strain, it becomes quite obvious that there is also a inverse linear relationship. Where does this come from? Where does this uh, obvious statement comes from? It might be coming from the matrix multiplication, matrix uh, relationship. If you say we have a vector of sigma equals six by six matrix of elastic constants equals by vector of strain. And obviously there might be also that there exists also a matrix which is inverse to this one. We label it Sij. And we say Sij times C jk equals an identity matrix um, by which we then have a linear relationship. So this one becomes one. Okay? And we have a linear relationship between the strain and the stress, just opposite. So from known stress, we can calculate strain. This is called inverse Hooke's law. And it's written here in the tensorial form. Uh, equivalently to the uh, to the 
relationship between the matrix of elastic constants and the fourth rank tensor of elastic constants, we can now also write a relationship between this fourth rank compliance tensor and the matrix of compliance is again six by six matrix. This relationship is now not straightforward as it was for the elastic constants or the direct Hooke's law. Again, we do have there some additional factors when we use the Foix notation. This might become confusing, but if you now think about the six by six uh, matrix of elastic constants, then these indices are, or these, these uh, special factors are like this. So in the upper left quadrant, we have one. In the bottom right quadrant, we have four. And in the other two quadrants, we have factor two. So this is these are the special factors that help us to translate between the components of the compliance tensor and the components of the compliance matrix. Right? Be careful about those factors. This is the, uh, the most common source of numerical mistakes in elastic evaluations. I would like to point here also to some more uh, fundamental features. What we very often use for the tensor in the direct Hooke's law is letter C coming from elastic constant. I'm using this a lot, elastic constants. I think this is what we all are used to call this elastic constants, or we call this also a stiffness tensor. Somewhere found that the difference between stiffness so stiffness constants or elastic constants comes from the American or British English. Nevertheless, for both of these, we actually understand and we know what we mean by that. We understand the tensor C. This physical quantity has a dimension of the stress. So it's typically expressed in gigapascals. Right? For softer materials, we might be using megapascals. The inverse quantity, which is labeled by S, has obviously the inverse dimension, which is the inverse gigapascal. So that's why when you look at this and it's expressed in pascals, then the numbers would be extremely small. While here we have something in the order of 10 to the power of 9, here we would have something in the order of 10 to the minus 9 pascal, inverse pascal. Um, the name for this quantity S, for this material property S, I will be using here, and I mostly use, is compliance. This comes from American English. In British English, this quantity is often used or is often referred to as modulus. This is completely confusing because you know Young's modulus, you know, bulk modulus, you know, shear modulus, all of these moduli have the dimension of elastic constants. And indeed, they are calculated from elastic constants. So this terminology modulus here is confusing. That's why I prefer certainly for the quantity S that comes through the inverse Hooke's law to use compliance. Nevertheless, also, this is not without any uh, cons. It brings small confusion that if you look at the first letters of the names in American English, they are inverse to the letters commonly used to denote these material properties. S for compliance and C for stiffness. So please live with this and do not get confused. The nice thing about using the Foix notation is that obviously to calculate an inverse tensor, the real tensor for component tensor might be not straightforward and might be difficult. Whereas when we come to the matrix and that's what I did here at the uh, beginning of this slide, 
we can simply calculate the inverse of the matrix, matrix inversion, which is, well, I do not want to claim it's, it's trivial when you do it on a piece of paper, but it's, it's trivial calculationally. Pretty much any uh, computational software can calculate this. And to calculate the inverse matrix uh, provides you directly with the components of the compliance matrix. Elastic constants and compliance uh, constants or compliance tensor, compliance matrix, all of those are material properties. They describe the relationship between stress and strain. This relationship depends on the material that we have. It further depends on the symmetry of this material, on the crystal symmetry. And it can be shown that based on the crystal symmetry, we will have a certain shape of this six by six matrix. This is an extremely useful relationship, again, taken here uh, or adopted from the NICE book. Um, let me start with this matrix that we have here. What it says is that the six by six matrix can be actually reconstructed known by knowing three numbers, by knowing the number C11, which is here on the upper part of the main diagonal. We have used this already in our evaluation previously when we rotated the uh, elastic constants right, of the titanium nitride. So for any cubic material expressed in the crystallographic cubic coordinate system, then the first three numbers on this uh, main diagonal will be identical numbers. The same thing for the bottom three numbers for C4455 and 66, all of those are identical numbers. And finally, C12, C13 and C23 will be identical numbers as well. That is why for cubic systems, all I need to provide are three numbers, which then fully define the elasticity of such a cubic material. C11, C12, and C44. Those components of the matrix are zero, And the components below the main diagonal, they are symmetrically uh, equivalent to those above. Right? So here I have again C11, uh, C, sorry, C12, and here I have the zero components. If we go from cubic to isotropic material, material which has the same elastic response in all crystallographic directions, then the number of independent elastic constants reduces from three to two. This is the lowest number of elastic constants that can be in general. And the form additionally implies a relationship between C11 and C12 and C44, namely, it says that C44 equals one half of C11 minus C12, all right? So if I provide you with two numbers, for example, C11 and C12, and tell you that this is an elastic isotropic material, you have complete information about dealing with the elastic response of such material. If we now go to the other extreme, to the most uh, general case, exhibiting the least symmetry, so all directions are different, and there is no crystal symmetry, then we end up with the 21 independent components, the number that we have already met at the beginning of this lecture. And I would like to point you here to two more examples. <clears throat> the first one is the tetragonal class, Specifically, we focus on this one, this uh, classes. <coughs> Excuse me. 
in which now we see that C11 and C22 are identical. Well, that's because the X and Y axis are identical. Right? So it does not matter along which of these directions we would compress or deform our material, we get the same response. The same thing is that we have here the C44 and C55 identical. C44, again, is what? Is C, um, Y, Z, C, Y, Z, which is a component of the tensor, which relates uh, sigma Y, Z. Uh, C, Y, Z, Y, Z to the epsilon Y, Z, right? So this is the component that relates the shear component of the stress tensor in the Y, Z plane to the shear component of the deformation of the strain tensor also in this Y, Z plane. Right, but of course, this is the same again, by the symmetry, as the relationship between the shear component of the stress in the XZ plane and the shear component of the strain in the XZ plane. And in the XZ plane, we get CXZ, XZ, which is C55. Well, that's the relation that we have here. C44 and C55 are identical. And similarly, you can understand why C13 and C23 are identical, again, relating the sigma ZZ, for example, with epsilon XX is the same as with epsilon YY, with the shear, uh, with the uh, normal components of the strain tensor along the X or Y axis. So overall, for the tetragonal systems, we end up with six independent elastic constants. And here I'm making the last comment and that is coming to the hexagonal systems. Hexagonal system is very, very exciting. The number of independent constants reduces from six to five. The symmetry is very similar to the tetragonal system, but C33, uh, sorry, C66 is given as C1 as one half C11 minus C12. Hmm. What does that mean? Well, that's the same relationship as we have for the isotropic uh, isotropic system. And what is C66? Well, that's the relationship between sigma xy and epsilon xy. That means the shear components of the stress and strain tensor in the xy plane. And the xy plane is the basal plane of the hexagon. In other words, if I forget about the third dimension, about the hexagonal axis, then the in-plane axis, the basal plane of a hexagon, is elastically isotropic. This is quite an interesting feature of hexagonal systems. And it is pure consequence of the symmetry, crystal symmetry of the material. Please remember that if you take a hexagon, you look at the basal plane like this, no matter whether you deform it in this or that or that direction, the elastic response is the same. In other words, if you make a cylinder out of elastically isotropic material, of course, then the deformation in all of those directions is going to need the same deformation, will need the same force in all of those directions. But what we are saying now is that if we do the same thing for hexagonal system, where this is the triple O1 axis, the hexagonal axis, and out of this hexagonal system, for example, titanium, we carve out a cylinder. And the cylinder will exhibit isotropic elastic response in the directions perpendicular to this cylindrical axis. Quite a cool feature, isn't it? 
So what we can do with the elastic constants, um, if we now remind ourselves about the expression for the strain density, uh, strain energy density. So the strain energy can be calculated as the integral over the whole space. And then we integrate for each of these spaces, the force times the uh, ij, right? And we go here, uh, we go from the deformation from zero to our final uh, strain tensor. So this is how the uh, deformation is, uh, the, the strain energy is defined, how we obtain it. If we now calculate the density, so maybe we assume that everywhere in the space, the stress and strain are homogeneous, then we get that W over volume, which is the quantity that I have here, is simply sigma ij d epsilon ij, which now when we say we have a material which follows the linear elasticity, the Hooke's law, and we get here from zero to epsilon c i j k l epsilon k l d epsilon i j, which will eventually end up with one half c i j k l epsilon k l epsilon i j. So we end up with the very well known. Oh, sorry, this is a wrong here. The wrong half. So we end up here with the. Oh, sorry. No. Now I would have to think, but yes, I think it's it's wrong here, right? Uh, so we would end up with this very well known formula for the elastic uh, energy density. Now, what do we expect from mechanically stable material? We expect that whenever you apply a certain deformation, you have to act with certain non-zero force. You have to introduce additional energy into the material. So if this quantity really describes the strain energy, for mechanically stable material, we request that this value is always positive. If it is negative, what does that mean? It means I introduce a deformation, but actually I gain energy out of the system. Well, this is bad, right? It means that I remove energy of the system by making by, by deforming it, it means that this will spontaneously proceed and the material will spontaneously deform, it will release the energy. And it will deform until it reaches its mechanically stable configuration in which no matter which deformation do I apply to my material, I have to introduce positive energy. And so this uh, request, the strain energy density must be positive, is also uh, related to the fact that the matrix of elastic constants must be positive definite. This quadric form must be positive definite, which leads to this uh, mathematical term that the matrix Cij must be positive definite. What does that mean? In practical terms, it means that all eigenvalues of this matrix must be positive. And also in practical terms, when you want to calculate this, you can calculate all minors of this matrix. That means if you have a six by six matrix, you calculate this determinant, which is just a number, two by two determinant, three by three determinant, four by four, and all of those determinants, which are called minors, must be positive. If this is fulfilled, it's the equivalent condition to the fact that all six eigenvalues of this matrix are positive, and, all, and, and also the minimum eigenvalue, therefore, is positive. If this is all fulfilled, it's equivalent with the fact that Cij is positive definite, and this is equivalent with the condition that the strain energy density is positive definite quadric form. And we have mechanically stable material. This relatively 
hard mathematical definition can be reformulated for some high symmetry cases. And for example, for cubic materials, it leads to the well-known born uh, huang stability criteria. Um, maybe you have seen that, maybe not. But if you ever see a cubic material and someone tells you, all right, the elastic constants are C11, C12, and C44, you can immediately check whether the phase structure that has been uh, described, and most of this comes to the theoretical description, uh, whether it has been described by these three elastic constants, whether it's mechanically stable. Both C44 and C11 must be positive. On top of that, C11 must be larger than C12 in absolute value. And on top of that, C11 plus 2 C12 must be, equal, uh, must be larger than zero. So these three inequalities must be fulfilled and can be actually derived from this fact that Cij must be positive definite and the actual shape of the tensor of elastic constants for cubic systems. So here is an example of a couple of materials. For titanium nitride, we have met here already before for the rock salt structure. This can be uh, very easily shown. This is positive, this is positive, this is larger than C12. And since all three numbers are positive, obviously the last condition is also fulfilled. So this is good, this is good guy that's positively, uh, that, that this uh, mechanically stable material. What about tanks nitride? Well, C44 is negative. Aha, uh -huh. so this is not going to be a mechanically stable material. And indeed, tanks nitride does not exist as a freestanding bulk material in the rock salt structure. Tanks nitride itself uh, would prefer to be hexagonal. Or then, if uh, we force it to be in the B1 structure, then the stoichiometry of tungsten nitrogen would change. It will not be one to one, but then we talk about tungsten two nitride, for example, structures where we have nitrogen vacancies that eventually lead to the stabilization of this structure. It can be shown that such structure with nitrogen vacancies uh, leads to a change in the elastic constants such that the C44 will become positive. Here we have one more example of titanium aluminide in the B2 structure. B2 structure is a BCC-based lattice uh, where we have different atoms in the corners of the lattice and a different atom in the center of the cube. Right? So then we have perfectly ordered structure. For titanium aluminide, all looks fine. C11 uh, is positive, C44 is positive. Uh, C11 plus 2 C12 is positive because they are all positive, but C11 is smaller than C12. And we fulfill, uh, we, we uh, do not fulfill the second inequality, which leads to the conclusion that this is also mechanically unstable. And indeed, this is mechanically unstable. Such a structure would spontaneously phase transform from this PCC based structure towards a uh, tetragonally deformed FCC structure. Uh, it would, for those of you who are familiar with that, it would undergo a Bain transformation from BCC to FCC. Uh, for hexagonal systems, the inequalities become increasingly more complex, more complicated. We see here that uh, we end up again with three inequalities here, but now involving more elastic constants. And one can check that, for example, the Wurzite aluminum nitride I had mentioned here before uh, fulfills the mechanical stability. So indeed, this can be a ground state, a thermodynamically stable structure of, uh, of aluminum nitride. If you are now asked to really put the numbers in the six by six matrix of elastic constants, uh, you need to also know the C66 component. And here, do not re, uh, forget about the relationship of the elastic constants uh, for the hexagonal system, right? So the C66 would be one half C11 minus C12. Uh, 
all those inequalities, either you remember them because you work with those materials on a constant basis, or you remember that C1, uh, Cij must be a positive definite matrix, or in other words, that all eigenvalues must be positive. And the same way that you would use maybe MATLAB, maybe Python, maybe Mathematica to invert the matrix Cij to come to the compliance matrix Sij. You can ask those software tools to calculate the eigenvalues. It give you six values, lambda one, two, lambda six. You simply look at the minimum one of those and check whether it's positive or not. And you immediately have the answer for any crystal symmetry, whether your material is mechanically stable 